Uh, I'm Duncan McTavish. I'm so far as uh, business development lead for research and academic institutions and also uh, international government institutions. Um, I'll be moderating today's webinar, the title of which is Improving Reliability and Flexibility of Subsurface Sensing. Um, so go ahead and, all right. Um, yeah, it's so far we know that collecting ocean data at scale uh, is, is difficult, it's hard. Uh, we believe that it shouldn't be. So our panelists today for this webinar will, will discuss how SOFAR approaches this challenge from a technology development perspective um, and how spotter and smart mooring have enabled new approaches to maritime sensing in their respective regions. Um, first, we're gonna hear from Evan Shapiro, who is co-founder and CTO of SOFAR Ocean. Um, and then next, we'll hear from Hayden Henderson at Michigan Technological University. Uh, Hayden is a research engineer and lecturer at MTU, longtime spotter uh, and smart mooring user, and one of the foremost experts in the deployment of oceanographic equipment in the Great Lakes. Um, and then finally, we're gonna hear from Ahmad Alag Agoli um, from Coralive, who's based in the Seychelles. Um, Ahmad has pre-recorded his presentation because of the time zone difference, um, but we will hear from him virtually. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Evan uh, to take us away. Thank you, Duncan. Um, so when we think about designing things for the ocean, uh, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that it's really hard to get things to survive. It is probably the harshest environment that we design electronics and complex systems to survive in. It's much harder than, than space. Uh, there are chemicals and pressures and temperature extremes, and there is the life that we are measuring and protecting, which is trying to break everything that we put into the ocean. And our goal is to make ocean sensing accessible and scalable at uh, at many different levels, and that introduces some competing uh, constraints, some competing requirements. We want to make things really small. We want to make them really affordable. We also need to make sure that they're going to last in the toughest environment we can imagine. When we add the flexibility aspect on top of this, now we want to make it so that we can change those things. And every time we change something on a system, no matter how simple it is, it's terrifying to change it and then put it in the water and hope that it lasts another year or two. And so, uh, we have made uh, a lot of uh, investments and headway and learnings towards these ends in our systems. And we'll talk about some of that today. So we need to invest in, in, in measuring and testing uh, in the design phase. And there are, there's facilities, there's equipment that we can build, there's simulations that will uh, teach us where weak points might be that we can try and find and isolate failures. Um, so we have robots and other facilities that we use for testing extreme conditions of expected exposure and use of these systems. We have simulation software that we work on to understand the dynamics and, and how that might load our systems. But none of that replaces the need to put systems in the water. And so alongside the, the lab testing and the simulation, we have to be deploying hundreds, thousands of things. To date, we've shipped around 350 of our smart mooring systems uh, and accumulated a, a combined more than 12 million ocean hours of observations. And we've seen systems survive in the uh, most extreme circumstances and we've seen systems felled by a simple bivalve. Uh, overall, we're really happy with the performance of these systems, but uh, I wanna just emphasize that putting things in the water is a requirement for developing marine uh, technology that'll last. Uh, along this journey, we've made a lot of progress, we have a lot of updates. So there is the, the capability of the, of the system, what it can measure, the data that it outputs. Uh, we've also been focusing a lot on how do, we, how do we ease the operational envelope of that? How do we make it as simple as possible to go from, you get a box in the mail and data in a dashboard. And so there are new uh, deployment methods, we have new flotation and mooring designs available, um, bottom releases that allow uh, dropping an anchor in a 
in, in situations where that's acceptable. And we're building out our suite of fleet management and alerting features so that you can have more of these in the water, get data about the system health, uh, get an automated alert if something is going sideways and be able to maintain larger fleets with minimal effort. We are also going to be um, releasing some new exciting capabilities on the platform. So we have a, a new uh, capability, a new sensing capability, which is to measure uh, subsurface currents. So this is a, uh, a Doppler current sensor. It's a single point sensor, so it's more compact than a profiling ADCP, more affordable, lower power as well. Uh, this can be placed anywhere in a mooring line and get a 2D measurement of the, the currents in dynamics. You can also use data from this to infer turbidity. It's a um, measuring part particulates. And when you look at the signal strength, you can, you can get some other clever things out of the sensor. So this will be available uh, early next year to plug and play into any smart mooring. Uh, we also have a bristlemouth development kit and so if you do not have uh, the sensor of your choice available on the smart mooring, you can use one of these and add a, a sensor. So this is a kit that's designed for integrating into smart moorings. It provides power and data connectivity through the spotter and the SOFAR backend platform uh, to any sensor that you might want to integrate and install in the field. When we think about having these uh, new sensing channels, we also get very interesting combinations of, of data turning into new insights. And so imagine if you had a water level sensor co-located with a current meter and you can now build flow resistance and storm surge models. Or if we think about subsurface currents and temperature stratification, and we can understand circulation a lot better. So the combination of these data channels in a, in a framework that makes it easy to plug and play and you can mix and match the ones you want, that's where we're really excited to see what our customers are doing and creating new data products out of these simple sensors. Um, the, the development kit, uh, is the, the distinction between this and, uh, one of the commercial sensors is there is work that has to go in here to integrate a sensor and, uh, and get the data into the, into the back end. but it is still adhering to all of the goals that we're setting for smart mooring and that it's a marine grade payload tube. It's using bristlemouth connectors, which we have deployed tens of thousands of sides to the ocean. And uh, we get the same integration support of one of these on a smart mooring in terms of data to the back end, being able to access it over API, being able to collect it and store it historically for a, a long dwell. So uh, I, I definitely encourage folks to reach out if they are interested in sensors that you can't get off the shelf today in a smart mooring. Um, we can talk about site-specific solutions, what the, the best path might be to get the data that you need where you need it. All right. And uh, I'll just hand it right over to Hayden Henderson, who is uh, an engineer at Michigan Technological University, MTU, uh, and has probably more experience than any of us in actually doing this in the field. So, uh, afternoon. Um... Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a research engineer for Michigan Tech University, more specifically the, the Great Lakes Research Center. Um, so we're located on the shores of the largest lake in the world. Uh, the joke is that all the lakes are great, only one is superior. Um, I'd like to acknowledge we're located on traditional Ojibwe lands, um, seated in the Treaty of 1842, as are the rest of the, the Great Lakes um, as part of the Anishinaabe. Um, so Michigan Tech is a, is a four-year um, public Public Engineering College. Um, we, we grant doctorate programs and, and do about $100 million a year in research expenditures um, with public and, and private sector. Um, about $10 million of that is, is at our facility there you see on the water. Uh, so some sort of geographical reference. We are on that peninsula. I'll do the classic Michigan thing. Um, here on the left hand, um, the northern part of that peninsula is actually an island. Um, colloquially referred to as Copper Island. Uh, at one point, about 100 years ago, 30% of the world's copper came from about a tri-county region uh, there in, in the middle of the lake. So geologically, um, a, a fairly new but interesting um, area. This is kind of what it's going to look like probably by the time I get home on Saturday. 
Um, we, we have large lake effect storm systems driven by that meteorological disagreement um, as, as weather's moving across the plains, hits a, a warm lake, right? And there's a, a large delta. So we get about 300 inches of snow um, in, in Keweenaw County, um, sort of where I live. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a little bit more time sort of qualifying the Great Lakes because I, I think it's important to understand that it is truly uh, a, a good use, use case and in, in domain for the reliability of, of some of these systems and, and they are not just um, sort of small, if you will, I, I guess actually, uh, how many folks in the room have been to the Great Lakes, or, or even offshore. Okay. How many folks have been out miles or more in the Great Lakes. Okay. Yeah, half a dozen or so. Um, so on, on the left, these are our watersheds. You'll note this obviously shares an international boundary. Um, this is an interesting constraint a lot of the times from a, a funding or governmental perspective. Uh, on, on the right, sort of some rudimentary parameters about the lakes. Um, you'll note that, that the mean depth um, of, of four of the five is, is hundreds of feet um, up to, to 1,300 feet in, in Lake Superior. Um, on the watershed's note, um, that watershed is drinking water for 40 million people uh, in, in the US from, from west to east there. Um, this is really tough to see. It's one of my favorite graphics of the Great Lakes, but it only exists in this hard copy book that I own that I can't find anywhere online. On the left is the, the Pacific Coast, um, including the Aleutians on down to San Diego. Um, the, the central line is, is the Great Lakes region. And then on the right, um, the Atlantic coast from sort of Halifax, I think down to, um, this includes the Gulf. Um, if you were to omit um, Alaska, there are more miles of coastline in the Great Lakes than there are the contiguous Atlantic and Pacific coasts combined. Um, so aside from drinking water and, and beauty, et cetera, uh, we also have a lot of commerce. This is a, an AIS heat map from, from marine traffic. Uh, if the Great Lakes were their own economy, we would be the third largest in the world by GDP. Um, and then I think another sort of fun example in the Bay Area, uh, the Ambassador Bridge, which spans um, the river between Lake Huron and Lake Erie, is responsible for more trade than the entire US does with France, Germany, or the United Kingdom. Anyway, uh, maybe I'm starting to sell it. Well, one last thing but before we get into some, some use cases is it's important to understand um, this, this topographical element to the Great Lakes and that they're all in a way running downhill to the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, the unique thing or interesting thing is that population density almost mirrors this same gradient in elevation. And so Lake Superior is the most oligotrophic lake in the world. It has a visibility to a hundred feet. And then you have severely anthropogenically impacted Lake Erie and Lake Ontario near those hubs of, of industrial productivity. Um, in, in the Great Lakes region. Um, again, just trying to illustrate sort of this cumulative stress and this gradient that exists across the Great Lakes. And I just point this out because for folks like myself, it's a challenge because we have to work across um, many observing system constraints and, and parameters of, of interest. Lake Superior is sort of a sentinel large lake global observation in, in the era of climate change. And so many observations there are simply about more simple parameters, um, surface temperature and, and so on, and, and the ability of it to sort of be a, a sink for climate change. Whereas Lake Ontario, Lake Erie are, are heavily packed, impacted by um, invasive species, anthropogenic inputs, nutrient, um, agriculture, uh, so on and so forth. So, so again, just illustrating kind of this difficulty um, that, that I often face in, in trying to um, observe the, the right things, um, you know, for, for science, for public safety, for public health, and so on. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a, an integrated ocean observing system regional association that's GLOSS, the Great Lakes Observing System. Um, this is their new API um, sort of platform seen here. Um, they, they, on the whole, fund the most observing system network um, work in the Great Lakes, as they are congressionally mandated to do. Um, it, the freshwater, because they're wind-driven waves, right, we are not subject to, to these tidal forces that... Um, often dictate swell um, in, in the oceans. And so uh, napkin math, it, you know, our, our buoys are seeing about twice as many sort of annual oscillations. If you were to put one in a Great Lake and put one in the ocean, we're getting a wave every five seconds. You guys are getting one every 10. Um, I realize that's a, that's a broad stroke, but I think it, it sort of, um, again, is, is a good point in, in some of the durability of, of a lot of these platforms. Um, 
So a third of the registered boats in the United States are in the Great Lakes. Um, we, we have a $7 billion, $70 billion commercial um, recreational tribal fishing industry. That's 70,000 jobs as well. Um, and again, because of our wind driven nature, um, the, the stratification, the thermal regime of lakes changes very frequently. Um, so this is, this is spotter API data um, from a buoy about four miles out in Lake Michigan on the, on the bottom plot, um, sort of a four sensor configuration. You can see from, from spring in June to recovery in October, we have many periods of sort of water exchange. Um, in, in one thing, I think it's important to, to try and describe is that the lakes are large enough that masses of water are moving as opposed to localized conditions changing. So this, this does not represent when you see, um, you know, a thermal migration at lower depths, that's not a localized change or, or subject from that, that local solar radiation. This is probably water from somewhere else that is, that is moved and is now occupying that space where the observation um, is being made. All right, so, so, so moving on, we're talking about stratification. We were able to observe that quite easily um, through, through a sort of stock um, smart mooring configuration. Um, a, an example of the public safety benefit to that is, is we're subject to large upwellings of cold water where there's hypothermic risk in the near shore. Um, an example of that with our, our friends at National Weather Service. Um, the National Weather Service, we have 10 forecast offices and five just in one lake. And so part of my job and them being one of my main stakeholders and, and sort of groups that I, I hope to serve um, in, in the regional associations hope to serve, um, it includes meeting with them. And so it's really difficult. Um, it was really difficult to plan med ocean observations for each of these forecast offices in, in annual meetings, um, but smaller, lighter weight platforms have allowed us to, to sort of give them something. Anyone who's dealt with National Weather Service knows they're fairly traditionally underfunded um, and so that's where we come in and, and sort of try and help. And that has, that has direct uh, public safety implications. Um, furthermore, uh, through, through folks like Great Lakes Observing System, um, there's a newly minted marine sanctuary uh, spanning about 100 miles in Lake Michigan. Uh, they were able to procure three um, smart moorings and, and locate them at, at traditional um, popular recreational diver safety sites near shipwrecks. Um, this year alone, uh, there was 10,000 unique users between those three buoys and, and 80,000 views of that data. Um, the guy in this photograph is a good friend of mine, bless his heart, love him to death, but he is an archaeologist. And so this is sort of an example of, of some of the beauty where these, these were put together, you know, in my shop, thrown in a truck, driven to his small dive boat, and he's able to, to sort of run out and, and deploy them um, while I'm sitting at home worrying about something else. Um, the other sort of unique meteorological feature we have in the Great Lakes are meteor tsunamis. So you can imagine weather moving across the plains and, and sort of accumulating with great force. And then it meets a, a warm or cold lake, depending on the time of the year. Um, and so we get these large surface pressure. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Whoops. Pressure gradients, right? That cause these, these tsunami like waves um, across the lake surface. And now how do I get back? don't speak Mac very well. I survived. Um, so that can produce four or five meter rogue waves. And you can imagine if you were a beach goer and that occurred sort of stochastically. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Cluck. I'm here with Jennifer Day and uh, four other speakers. Computer for now. We'll worry about that later. Uh, in, in response to that, um, uh, Duncan and Tosca and the folks like myself went after a funding opportunity to develop um, an observing system platform to kind of address that. So we're doing some in-lake bottom pressure sensing um, and, and hoping to relay that data at a, at a high data rate in real time um, to measure those low frequency waves at a high frequency, um, sort of as a, as a early warning system, if you will. Um, and in these instances, I think it's important to, um, to think about spotters and some of the smart moorings as a power and telemetry solution, as opposed to just like this wave buoy system. Because this is an instance where the problem presented itself, how do we monitor it? Okay, bottom pressure is an obvious one, that's how it's done with the DART buoys through NOAA and, and, and tsunami detection system. And then, okay, how can I easily affordably get that data to the surface, um, you know, and up, up to the cloud, so on and so forth. Um, you might've heard about this thing we're doing called deep learning um, AI. So one of the things we've started to do 
with within our geophysical um, fluid dynamics lab at Michigan Tech is sort of spin the, the modeling question back around and have the model determine where observations are going to be most valuable to future iterations of the model. So that's an example of what you see here where um, an FVCOM, you know, community ocean model was run. And then these grid squares were identified as the locations where there was the most uncertainty um, in this case in, in surface temperature. Um, and so we can sort of use that to steer observations. A um, few, few other quick use cases. Um, NOAA colleagues are, are about to do some hypoxia monitoring in central Lake Erie. That's a huge drinking water um, hub and implication. Um, again, a, a solution where or an instance where, you know, bottom DO, that hypoxia can occur in very thin layers, you know, within a, a meter of, of lake bottom. Um, and then how do we get that data back to the surface and in real time? Um, last one is kind of a, a new new one that we uh, were swashing around at the end of the year, which is this idea of, of a worksite deployment. Um, we're doing like weeks on end of multi-beam ROV, ROV AUV operations in like 30 to 50 meter uh, excuse me, mile areas and in needing, needing weather data annu uh, daily to make like sort of go no go decisions on if we're going to go work that day or what, what groups can go work that day. Um, and then anyone who's, who's ever done um, underwater acoustics, that's obviously greatly affected by, by sound speed. And so thermal, thermal gradients. And so having this kind of real time inference, especially again, where we get those, those big changes and upwellings and that behavior can change very dramatically and stochastically. So again, that gives us an inference of, okay, we, we're having a nearshore upwelling event right now. And so now, now it's 4C from you know, near top to bottom and we need to change our sound speed profile for that multi-beam acquisition or that USBL acquisition, um, underwater acoustics type, type stuff. Again, the, the big picture idea being, hey, we're gonna work in this area for three weeks. It'd be really nice to have um, some, some real-time data. Let's throw something over the side. Uh, lastly, with uh, my sort of pursuits with Bristlemouth and in the Pioneer program, there's a slight typo here. Are, are the Great Lakes a source or sink of CO2? And the answer is yes. Um, things like that don't occur sort of on this like perfectly linear, always throughout the day cycle, right? CO2 production and consumption is heavily tied to photosynthesis. And so um, making discrete ship-based observations, especially in, in the productive parts of the Great Lakes, is, is completely and wholly sort of insufficient. Um, but there are currently no routinely deployed or service observing systems measuring carbonate system variables in the Great Lakes. And, and there's large global, global climate change implications for whether or not large lakes, freshwater lakes can, can be sources or sinks of CO2. These are important questions for, for um, carbon budgeting and, and so on and so forth. Um, the Great Lakes are also on the, on the right expected to acidify at, at the same rate as the oceans. Um, so I, I intend to integrate and co-locate um, pH and PCO2 sensors with the bristle mouse system. Um, having two of those variables for the, the, the carbonate system chemistry um, allows you to sort of give a, um, as opposed to just CO2, uh, more of a quantification on the, the carbonate system. Um, the advantage of that is that these are still, um, these are not maintenance free sensors, very fickle electrochemical membrane based sensors. Um, so thinking of going to have to haul up a large discus med ocean buoy to service one of these sensors or replace a membrane is really difficult. Um, thinking about going up and pulling up just a little spotter buoy, getting it on deck, swapping out a membrane, um, and we're back in service for six months or whatever it may be. Um, again, a, a use case of a, a power and telemetry solution. Yeah, uh, that's what I have for you. Thanks for, for bearing with me. This is a, a plain spotter deployment, but um, got to throw one out of a helicopter one time. Yeah. I'm the founder and director of Coral Life. We mostly focus on coral restoration. So for us, it's very important to have um, lots of data, live data preferably. So I'd like to um, share some of the experiences that we have with the Aqualink smart buoys from SOFAR Ocean. Um, the majority of our work uh, happens in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so Maldives and Seychelles are uh, two of our nations that we um, have our projects. Um, Sneva Fushi and Sneva Secret um, in the Maldives, as well as Fregat in the Seychelles. Um, to be upfront, the biggest challenge um, when deploying a smart buoy is the mooring block. So what we decided in the end is we usually combine several smaller moor mooring blocks and then interconnect them. 
um, as transporting one big block is quite quite challenging if you don't have the appropriate um, equipment. So the total weight usually is around 160 to 200 kilograms total. Um, then once that is in place, um, the deployment of the buoy itself is super easy. Um, the best is to activate the buoy as late as possible. So when you are on a boat, um, maybe just take off, uh, to take, to take the Allen key with you, take off the, the, the top, um, just turn it on, wait until you have all the, the signals uh, going green and um, close it off. And then probably best is somebody is in the water already, a diver, you hand over the bottom a sensor, he will go down, he or she will go down and um, just attach it to, to the mooring block. And then that's it. From then on, it's it's on. Um, very important also to know um, is that the swivel shackle needs to be on the bottom of the buoy. Otherwise, there are chances for entanglement and we want to avoid that. Um, in terms of maintenance, um, it's certainly good to check on the shackles every now and then. Um, the sensors also need a little bit of scrubbing and um, cleaning the solar panels every now and then um, is good. We usually do this every three to four months. So not even such a big um, uh, uh, workload for that. Um, here are some of the impressions um, what uh, from our work, um, just from transporting it to the boat, to um, handle it on the boat, installing it on the water, usually very simple. Um, and then uh, just beautiful, beautiful pictures when they are on the surface. Um, like I said, the transportation or the placement of the, the mooring block is always a bit of a challenge. So once we um, dropped one, we had to carry it on the water for a little bit because we needed a sandy, sandy spot and uh, that's where we dropped them. But we uh, place the buoy, uh, the mooring block a little bit uh, on a different space. Um, in terms of usage, um, there's several things that we derive from the data. And um, one of it was uh, used for master's thesis um, that we did on coral restoration on Frigate Island, where we correlated the temperatures to um, also the survival rate of our corals in the nursery. This helped us to determine the best schedule for coral outplanting. Um, regarding wind and wave action, this was also used um, or is being used at the moment for our um, hotel in the north uh, of the Maldives, which is Suneva Secret. Here, um, as it's a bit of a smaller island, we decided to install a floating um, PV. And for that, the base structures needs to have a certain, um, you know, um, uh, strength. So based on the data that we derive from uh, wave height uh, and 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 also strength, we can determine how strong the the, the base structure of the floating PV needs to be. Um, in terms of outplanting corals, um, the the barometric pressure, the wind and wave uh, action also helps us to determine the schedule for our for our uh, boat. So um, the uh, the days where it's just too rough, we don't even consider um, outplanting. Hence, um, this can be helping, let's say, for for throughout the whole year, um, knowing when the seasons are, when to outplant and when when not. Um, and a nice, nice um, uh, outpost is also our little TV with the Aqualink website that is just showing um, uh, at our science center. This is the cool part is that we have also installed an underwater camera. And this is always very exciting when our guests come to see and then, then they can see what hap what's happening on the water combined with data from, from the temperature, um, the wave action and so on and so forth. This, this is always something that guests really appreciate. So yeah, this is basically our uh, experience. Um, thank you for making these amazing products. Um, I'm very excited about upgrades and updates. And um, yeah, thank you for supporting um, us and, and um, making the, the ocean a better place again.